We are continuing our series on the Ten Commandments called Vital Signs. Uh, one of our directives here at TFRC is biblical obedience. Scripture is the primary lens we use to determine how we live. In medicine, vital signs are indicators of essential body functions, things like pulse and blood pressure, temperature, respiratory rate. These are life-sustaining functions. And in our changing world, we want to ground ourselves in biblical right and wrong. A great place to start is the Ten Commandments. Uh, they, they are vital signs for following Jesus. They can tell us how we are doing in following Jesus. And again, we are saved by grace, not works. Obeying the Ten Commandments is not grounds for salvation, but Jesus affirmed the Ten Commandments, and Jesus lived by the Ten Commandments, and he calls us to do the same. So using the Ten Commandments as vital signs indicate what is influencing us more, God's Word or our culture. In the series, we've been looking at the Ten Commandments from Exodus 20. You can also find them in Deuteronomy 5. Uh, we're on the Seventh Commandment. Uh, the scripture for this morning is Exodus 20, verse 15, and... Uh, Ephesians 4.28. Go ahead and turn there in your Bibles. Exodus is the second book in the Bible. Ephesians is a little over halfway in the New Testament. Uh, you can also look these passages up on your phones. Uh, Exodus 20, it gives the seventh commandment. And then Ephesians 4 describes what repentance looks like for breaking this command. Our scripture reader for this morning is Bill Hale. So Bill, go to make your way on up. And as he does so, I'm going to ask if you are able, please stand and face the center of the room. Uh, we stand because we believe this is the word of God. And we read from the center of the room to remind us that scripture is to be central in our lives. And so Bill, uh, whenever you are ready, please read from both Exodus 20 and Ephesians 4. Exodus 20:15. You shall not steal. And Ephesians 4.28, anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work. Do something useful with your own hands that they may have something to share with those in need. Bill, thank you very much. You may be seated. Now, how many of you have some kind of collection? Baseball cards, coins, stamps, some kind of collection. How many of you collect stuff? Okay, um, I've never been much of a collector. I do have a bunch of Packer gear, which this year is worthless. Um, one year I did collect a bunch of football cards. I did collect the entire 1981 NFL player card set. I never saved it, it's long gone. Uh, but I know plenty of people who collect stuff. I know someone who collects baseball cards, someone who has a doll collection. My wife uh, collects Starbucks coffee mugs. Um, one of our staff has a miniature tractor collection. Um, and so I just enjoy, you know, looking at the collections that different people have. And it's fun to hear stories about how they started it or where they found parts um, of their collections. And while some collections can be worth quite a bit of money, for most collectors, it's not about the money. They have a connection to their collection. And when it comes to um, stealing, stealing is simply taking something that belongs to someone else, and stealing is often associated with financial gain. We steal for materialistic purposes. So we see stealing as wrong because it damages others financially. Our stuff, though, isn't just about what it's worth. Like a collector's connection to their collections, our stuff is more than just its financial value. There is greater significance to our stuff. It's a simple command. You shall not steal. Don't take someone else's stuff. Well, why not? Well, yes, there is a financial component to the reason. But even more fundamental than that, 
Our stuff is an extension of us. Go back to a time when you've had something stolen from you. I once rode my bike uh, to a community college I was attending many, 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 many years ago, and uh, I intentionally parked my bike in a busy part of campus where there would be lots of people. And I parked it on a bike rack, and I had a lock, and I locked it up, and I came back a couple hours later, and yep, it's gone. Um, when someone steals your stuff, how do you feel? Maybe your house is broken into, or maybe your car is stolen, or maybe it's your purse or wallet, or whatever it might be. How do you feel when something is stolen from you? See, when my bike disappeared, I felt violated. They took my bike. You see, when people steal from us, we feel violated. Now, why do we feel violated? Because when something is stolen from us, nothing's happened to us. It was our stuff that was taken. We feel violated because our stuff is an extension of us. Now, an interesting little rabbit trail on this command. This command was originally taken to be primarily a prohibition against kidnapping. Now, I don't know exactly why it was taken that way, but I do know that it was. Now, kidnapping is a form of stealing. It's stealing someone else. But when you take someone else, you are taking their body. Well, our bodies are our most prized possession. So even if someone does something as simple as slap us on the face, we feel violated because they just assaulted our most prized possession. But back to our stuff, like our bodies, our stuff is an extension of ourselves. And it doesn't just have to be stealing. That violates us. Vandalism has the same effect. If someone takes a key to our car, we feel violated. If someone eggs our house, we feel violated. If someone were to knock down our crosses on our cross mount, we would feel violated. But nothing's happened to us in those examples. It happened to our stuff. But we still feel violated because our stuff is an extension of us. And so when we steal, it's not just about the financial value of the stuff. Collectors, if someone took your collection, that would devastate you. Even if you had insurance to cover the financial loss, the personal sense of loss and violation would stay with you for a long time. When we steal, we are violating someone else. And while our stuff is an extension of ourselves, our stuff isn't ultimate. Stealing demonstrates the wrong priorities. See, when we steal, we take someone else's stuff, violate them in the process, but our relationships are more important than our stuff. See, when we steal, the stuff we steal becomes more important to us than the person we steal from. J Jesus once had a man come up to him, and he wanted Jesus to tell his brother to give him his share of an inheritance. And Jesus responds to this man by saying in Luke chapter 12, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. We live in the most materialistic culture in the history of the world. We are bombarded with the message that life is about our stuff. That's the value of the world. 
But that is not our value as followers of Jesus. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. Now, I have walked with a number of people at the end of their lives. And I have never once heard someone nearing the end of their life talk about the importance of their things. Not once ever. They always talk about people nearing the end of their life. They always talk about the importance of their family and friends. Every time. Let's not wait until the end of our lives to realize what really matters. Let's realize it now. Prioritize the people in our life over the possessions of our life. Stealing demonstrates upside down priorities, possessions over people, but when we steal, we also forget where our stuff comes from. We forget the source of our stuff. God is the source of our stuff. Yes, we work hard. Yes, we have gifts and abilities. Yes, we have to make the most of the opportunities before us. But we are not the source of our stuff. Without God, we have nothing. Our gifts and abilities, our work ethic and opportunities, they all come from God. Even the fact that we were born in the most prosperous country in the history of the world, that was a gift from God. Or the fact that we immigrated to the most prosperous country in the history of the world, that was a gift from God. As it says in James 1, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. Think about it this way. Pretend that you have two young children. Now, I know some of you do have two young children, but just pretend that all of us have two young children, okay? Now, we love them both, love them both, and we want to bless them. And we want to give them some sense of joy in a very simple way. So we give both of them a sucker for them to enjoy, something simple. Now, let's say that one child steals the sucker from the other child. I know that would never happen, but just pretend for a second. Or some other kid comes by and takes one of the suckers. Or maybe the other kid takes both of the suckers. You, as the gift giver, how do you feel? You would still feel violated. Even though what was taken was not yours, you'd given it away. But you gave those gifts to your kids. And then someone stole the gifts that you gave them. You would feel disrespected. And I bet you'd be pretty upset. Especially if the thief knew that those were gifts from you. Well, stealing just doesn't violate others. It violates God too. Because God gives us our stuff as good gifts. And when we steal, we violate God because we took a gift that he gave to someone else. Again, it's a mix-up in priorities. When we steal, we value possessions over people. When we steal, we value goods over God. When we steal, we forget God's goodness to us. Or at the very least, we take God's goodness for granted. And stealing takes all kinds of forms. It's not just taking someone from someone else. Dishonest business practices, that's stealing. What's the value behind dishonest business practices? Uh, possessions over people. And the idea that business is business, that is not a biblical value. More than once, the Bible says, the Lord detests dishonest scales. 
The Lord detests dishonest business practices. So that goes for how employers treat their employees and customers, pay a fair wage, charge a fair price. But it also goes for how employees work for their employers. Doing just enough work so that you can keep your job, well, that's not right either. Now, this next one is going to be unpopular. So be it. Cheating on our taxes is stealing too. Now, it's okay. Maximize the deductions. You know, do what you got to do to maximize all that. I get it. That's fine. But when Jesus was asked about paying taxes, he said, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Now, I know what many of you are thinking. Well, Jesus never had to deal with the IRS. Well, yeah, because the tax collectors in Jesus' day were upright citizens, right? They were always honest. Uh, no, the IRS has nothing on the tax collectors in Jesus' day. They were the worst of the worst. And yet Jesus still said, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. God is the source of all good gifts. And we honor God when we are honest in how we use them. So stealing, it mixes up our priorities. It puts possessions before people, goods before God. But the opposite of stealing isn't to stop stealing. The opposite of stealing is to share our stuff. Going back to the passage in Ephesians, Ephesians 4, verse 28, where it says, anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their own hands that they may have something to share with those in need. A couple thoughts on this passage. First of all, when we work to earn something and then share that something with those in need, we get our priorities in line with the Bible. We give our possessions as a blessing to people. Rather than putting our possessions before people, our possessions become a means to bless people. That's the right priority biblically. This Christmas season, as we've been doing for years, we're doing something called Mission Christmas Joy. Three ways to bless others um, with our possessions. The shoebox ministry blesses kids around the world. Angel tree blesses kids with parents who are incarcerated. Christmas assistance blesses local families with kids. All of those things put people above possessions. And again, you can learn more about that in the missions corner in the octagon. And then there are places like the mustard seed thrift store. The mustard seed thrift store, their entire mission is to take our possessions and turn them into blessings for people. It's what they're all about, everything they do. And so many of us here at TFRC, we are a part of the mustard seed ministry, whether it's helping with the store or working as a consultant, and countless in our community have been blessed through mustard seeds ministry. Another thought is, again, going back to that whole idea, our stuff is an extension of ourselves. Well, think about what the implications of that are if we give some of our stuff away or use our possessions to bless people, if our stuff is an extension of ourselves. You know, one time a rich young ruler came to Jesus and asked him what he must do to inherit eternal life. And Jesus responds to him by saying in Luke 18, you know the commandments. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother. All these I have kept since I was a boy, he said. And when Jesus heard this, he said to him, you still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. If our stuff, is an extension of ourselves. What is Jesus telling this rich young ruler? 
He isn't simply giving the rich young ruler a social justice command. His stuff is an extension of himself. And so if he gives his stuff to the poor, he is giving himself to the poor. Now, how many rulers give themselves to the poor? Versus how many rulers give themselves to the rich? And by giving himself to the poor, by giving his possessions to the poor, he will have treasure in heaven, Jesus says. And part of what that means is now he has the same values that God has. And whenever we have the same values that God has, we are in a good place every time, all the time. When we give our stuff, we give a part of ourselves. And Jesus gave himself for us. Jesus died for our sins. Jesus rose from the dead. That's good news. It actually happened. And the gospel, it changes everything. God's goodness led him to give his son for us. An early interpretation of the command to not steal was a prohibition against kidnapping. Now, kidnapping for parents is one of the worst nightmares we have. We are always worried about the safety of our kids. And one of the worst things that could happen to us as parents is to have our kids taken from us, stolen from us, kidnapped from us. And we would give up anything in order to keep our kids safe. And God does just the opposite. In his goodness, God gives his son for us. And Paul picks up on God's goodness in Romans 8. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? God gives us good things all the time. For God... We are more important than things. But he gives us good things because of his love for us. And he wants us to see our possessions the same way. Things that could be used to bless the people in our lives. You shall not steal And as we reflect on God's goodness to us, remember the value behind this command. And the value behind the command is to mimic the goodness of God and use our stuff to be a blessing for others. Please pray with me. And Lord, we again come before you grateful for your goodness in all the different ways and shapes. Lord, from the things you have given us, from the giftedness you've given us, from the people you've brought into our lives, we thank you for your goodness. And Lord, help us have the same priorities that you have. And use the abundance of your blessings that you've given us and the ones specifically that come in the form of things and possessions and stuff and see them as things that we can use to bless what really matters, which is the people in our lives. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen.